I worked in uh, regenerative medicine, and when people ask me what is uh, regenerative medicine, then I have to tell them in few sentences what is that. And then I always uh, I had a talk uh, comparing the the science in uh, pharmaceutical industry, which is in a big crisis uh, because uh, drugs is very difficult to develop, and the average uh, rate of drug development is like. Uh, 25 uh, yearly approved by FDA, and academia is uh, full of fantastic uh, papers published in Nature, Science, Cell, and everywhere, and there is uh, no crisis on the horizon at, at this point. And then I always say that the future of uh, science is definitely in regenerative medicine, and I base this statement obviously not uh, downsizing the importance of other work, but as you well know, amphibians, fish, and neonatal mice can regenerate organs. And once the academia gives this information to pharmaceutical industry, there will be probably many, many more drugs uh, on, on the market. And I always recall Ezekiel from uh, the Old Testament who say, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll show you only two slides from another work. We show you uh, what Ezekiel meant uh, by heart of stone and heart of flesh, he probably had in mind the regenerative medicine, which will happen uh, a couple of thousand years uh, later. You know the work uh, from science, from Porello, and if you remove uh, the apical portion of the heart in uh, uh, blood clot forms very early, and then the scar forms, but this scar is very is fully transient. So this is not a scar which will remain. And then you have a full re regeneration by day 21. However, if you remove an apical portion of uh, a mouse on day seven, you repeat the same process and you see accumulation of extracellular matrix on day seven and on day 21, it is really a huge scar formed. It is a heart of stone. So my belief uh, is that you have this discrepancy between uh, regeneration and uh, situation when regeneration doesn't happen, like in mammals, like in men. You have to fight the scar if you want to make a regenerative process possible. And when I say to our neurobiologist, if you have a bigger brain, you have a bigger scar at the periphery because the brain is fighting against the formation and regeneration of the periphery because too much energy is needed and everything comes out of the brain on the uh, expense of the periphery. So it must be something I'm uh, just dreaming, but there must be some relationship between the neuroscience and the peripheral regenerative process. If, if you look into amphibians and if you look in, into fish, the mechanisms are absolutely outstanding. Our major field is uh, in within the factors of bone morphogenetic proteins. I show you only a couple of uh, several books uh, I have edited uh, with Dr. Sampat. Dr. Sampat is one of the pioneers in this field, and we work together on discovery of different uh, genes before the genome was already uh, available. And Dr. Sampat is as a co-editor with me on these books. He's a vice president of Genzyme in Boston, and he is very knowledgeable in the biotech area, in pharmacology, and so on. So, uh, you know, we work on uh, the family of proteins called bone morphogenetic proteins. So they are members of the TJ beta superfamily. And I would need like uh, five hours to lead you just through some of the members. So I'm not going to do that. And I would just say that TJ beta is on one side and BMPs or BMP like proteins are on the other side. They are separated, you know, in uh, sequence. So they are separated also in structure because uh, TJ beta has less cysteines in the mature portion of the protein, although they are all uh, uh, form dimers uh, of disulfide bonds, and they have very specific receptors, and the receptors and signaling is different between these proteins, although they use a very similar pathway. Uh, where I have been uh, extremely active are BMP5, 6, and 7. Uh, these members, uh, BMP7 is on the market, and BMP2 is on the market for bone uh, regeneration. They have faced uh, recently many clinical issues. I will just uh, very uh, broadly uh, mention them. 
uh, we have directly uh, uh, participated in the development of growth differentiation effect of 567. And these are also called uh, bone morphogenetic protein 12, 13, and 14. And they have significant functions. I don't have uh, time. And BMP3, that was the first one, which was discovered at NIH. But unfortunately, we did not succeed in cloning and sequencing because Genetics Institute was faster. And they pu published the sequence uh, before uh, we were ready. So we lost uh, that battle. But we gained this battle against, uh, against uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University. And then we also, uh, here is one member which is missing. This is GDF15. I don't know whether you know something about GDF15. It's uh, in heart regeneration and in ac acute myocardial infarction, very active recently. We discovered it and we give a name, a prostate-derived factor. It later became uh, GDF15, although I didn't spend much time then on GDF15. But that's a very in interesting member. And we ourselves uh, produce uh, these proteins simply uh, because uh, when I founded Genera Research in, in Croatia, then Herman Opperman, who made the cell line for BMP7, which is on the market, and who discovered BMP567, uh, he joined Genera Research, and he is now our main uh, technology uh, chief. He is also the founder of single-chain antibodies, and he did the first uh, uh, bifunctional antibodies ever at the end of end of 80s. Today is normal, and that was the introduction into the targeting at all. You know, that was the first targeting ever. So we have Herman Opperman with us. What is in green here, these are homologs from uh, fruit fly and uh, drosophila, uh, which are very sim uh, similar to BMPs. And uh, they are separated 700 million years at least from mammals, so the discrepancy is uh, very huge. Infuse is the bone device which is composed of BMP2, and Ossigraft is a, a device which is on the market and composed of BMP7. So these are two recombinant proteins in clinical use from this family. Uh, I have to mention SAMPAT, and this is one of the nicest uh, experiments I want to recall from the history. Uh, it was published, unfortunately, in PNS and should, should have been in Science. Uh, it says uh, we took the DPP homolog of the drosophila, and now the question is, in drosophila, DPP gene is responsible for the wings and is responsible for the GI system. Now I, pr I show you how you can come from wings to bone in just 11 days, and you do not need to wait 700 million years to develop from drosophila to mammals. You can take only 11 days by making DPP protein and by a standard procedure in CHO cells. It is a similar dimer, like all the BMPs, which has a molecular weight of about 35 kilodaltons. And now you take this recombinant protein and use it in a standard subcutaneous bioassay, which was a basis for discovery of all the BMPs uh, 25 years ago. I don't have time to tell you more about this. I'll show you once again this assay. So you take this, you put it on a piece of a collagen sponge and may make it here in axillary region. And then you obviously do not get wings and a gut, but you get bone. So you have immediate re-specialization of the gene from the drosophila into the gene making bone in mammals because you put it in a different microenvironment where the niche for this microenvironment and the cells is absolutely different than obviously in drosophila. So this is, from my point of view, something very, very nice. And then it was done also by disrupting the function of BMP2 and substituting the function of BMP2 by BMP4 in drosophila, and it fully uh, compensated for, for the loss. So that means that we have many, many members in the BMP family, but these are obviously uh, redundant to prevent uh, lethality in people. And I'll show you only one example where, where if redundancy and overlapping does not exist, uh, you are in huge uh, problems. I would say that uh, the, by the availability of bone morphogenetic proteins for fracture repair, indeed begin the new era of tissue regeneration. I'll show you what we have done so far. 
all, all under the uh, large uh, European grant to change the dogma of a current use of BMPs to make it possible without side effects. And I'll show you only a couple of slides. And uh, this is 1999. I have to go back to this uh, time to show you how in Netherlands you can get the permission to make a clinical trial which nobody else from the ethical point of view will not allow. And that is how we knew how BMPs work because clinicians said, no, 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 you cannot prove it is collagen which induces bone and not BMPs in human. And you can't convince anybody at the American Orthopedics Society meetings and then a rude guessing in Amsterdam, he said in the patients, to, which has a varus leg, so they have rounded legs, and now you have to make a corrective osteotomy of the tibia, and at the same time, you have to open here and remove a portion of the fibula. In these patients where you work on the tibia, he asked for a permission to put something in between the fibular ends. You remove the fibula so tibia can heal, otherwise fibula is disrupting it. And then he got the permission for 24 patients, 6666 for different therapies, in one nothing, in one just collagen, and in one he put uh, BMP plus the collagen, and he first time showed that BMPs really induce the bone fall formation, and from that moment on, all American surgeons believe, you know. So it's very difficult to convince surgeons that something works, you know. And that was, uh, the experiment which you got to do in human, you know. So this is an experimental design in human, and therefore from that point of view is a very, very nice uh, design. Convince the world and ask patients whether they agree to treat with something the fibula which is absolutely uh, bone bypassed in this uh, pro procedure. At this time, after so many years of uh, experience, we can say that the combinant bone morphogenetic proteins in the bone, they work on a muscular layer, they work on the periosteum, they work on endosteum, and the interrelationship between the cells have been explored a thousand times, and people believe they know the mechanism of action now very good. By the time when the devices of BMP2 and 7 were formulated, people didn't know what was the function of BMPs in bone remodeling. I'm not going into details now because we don't have time. And this is uh, how BMPs heal long, long bones, what guessing has showed. And that is, it starts from outside and goes inside and then slowly forms a periosteal uh, bone and it forms a cortical bone and then it fills in uh, the middle, and people didn't understand what was really going on uh, during formulation of the BMP. So major clinical issues, they are used also in Italy, in hospitals, probably in Trieste here as well. When? When the bone does not heal, when you do the spinal fusion surgery, then you use BMPs, but they are extremely expensive because one device, which consists of a recombinant protein, which you make a paste together with the collagen, and then this paste in open surgery is put in between the bone ends or around the bones, or fill the cysts, or you can put it uh, within uh, the vertebrae, and you can simply fuse the spine. But the major clinical issues in this, let's say, I would say, more than 17 uh, or more, almost 20 years of use, including clinical trials. Uh, they promote bone resorption, which was not known during formulation. They may exuberant bone formation in surrounding tissues, that is in the periosteum and in the muscles. And also, uh, physiologically, you see uh, only a small portion of BMP can tightly bind to collagen. I'll show you how much. So that what is not bound and put on a collagen sponge causes a lot of inflammation and swelling. And many people who were operated by spinal fusion for a cervical spine, they died because of swelling, because of breathing problems, and because of uh, laryngeal inflammation, swelling, and so on. People were not fast enough to make the tracheotomy, and you have death recovery and then NIH, uh, FDA just stood up and put a warning alarm and so on, and then uh, the sale of BMPs dropped significantly. And we were already developing a new, new device, trying to change all these problems we, we saw with BMP2 and, and 7. And, I'll, and that was the right moment because the market at this time is just fully open for a new BMP device. 
So this limited understanding of BMP role in bow remodeling, you know, when the devices were uh, made and formulated were not uh, understood at that time because nobody knew what endogenous BMPs are really in, in involved in bone for formation. Because if you, I'll show you when you knock out BMP2, what, what happens? But you know, people have done all the genetic models. I put like three examples here. But before it was not uh, possible. Although the molecular biology at the end of 80s and beginning of uh, 90s was not so developed. So conditional knockouts and everything didn't exist. So you could not show and prove what you can prove today elegantly and fast. Uh, here is one example. If you knock out BMP5, uh, the mouse has no auricle, so they have no outer ears. Why? It's not because some other BMP cannot replace this function. It is only because the site specificity exists for BMP5 during development, and there is no other BMP expressed in this tissue in auricle at that time. And that's enough to be born without an auricle. But any BMP can replace BMP5 in this matter. If you knock out BMP7, you would expect you have no skeleton. It's very important for a skeleton. However, you know, the mice are blind and they die of uremia 24 hours after birth because the kidney has not been developed. That is one of the projects we have been working on the last 15 years. If you knock out CDMP1, which we discovered in 1993 to 4, uh, you have this phenotype. You know, in a mutation, I don't have time for, for this now, but you see the axial skeleton is perfect and the peripheral skeleton is fully perturbed. So they're telling you what? That the axial skeleton and peripheral skeleton are different in development. And that's very important eventually for understanding the therapy later because by giving uh, different anti-osteoporotic drugs, you target bone and you do not target peripheral or axial bone. But the bones are definitely, during the development, very, very different. Okay, so what did we know about the BMPs in bone formation? Almost nothing. Because the knockout of BMP2, they die during embryonic development, and BMP7, and these are two proteins on the market, die upon uh, birth from uremia. They are both uh, combined with the collagen from bovine origin, like a collagen sponge, and then before using in a patient in an open surgery environment, you just mix BMP2 and 7 with the collagen, or BMP7 is already pre-mixed and you get it from the pharmacy pre-mixed and you just add it in between the bone ends or spinal fusion and so on. So that's the way how the BMPs have been used and nobody could have understood the problems which were apparent in the last uh, couple of years. So what happened then in a period between 2005 and uh, 2010, you know, people uh, finally explained what is the disruption of BMP signaling if you can do it only in mature osteoblasts. Everybody will say you will get a lot of, uh, you will have a loss of bone because the BMP signaling in osteoblasts is crucial for bone for formation. But look what happens. It's an increased trabecular bone. So you remove BMP signaling, it's an increased trabecular bone. So who is crazy? Why are you using then BMPs to make bone if the BMPs indeed uh, removed, increase the trabecular bone? So that became evident. Today we know because the BMPs have a significant impact on osteoclasts. So if you remove the signaling, then osteoclastogenesis goes down together with bone for formation. And then because of bone coupling and the bone cells are coupled in the bone. So you have an osteoclastogenic effect, which is uh, through the rank OPG pathway. And that signal for the loss of BMPs is stronger than the signal which tells osteoblasts to make bone. And that was uh, very surprising, but that was also expecting from the side effects seen at that time by BMPs, which showed, indicated that bone resorption is a very important phenomenon. If you now overexpress BMP4 in osteoblasts, what would you expect? You will expect uh, from a clinical point of view that you will get uh, more bone, but you decrease the bone volume as you compare the wild type and you compare the, the overexpressed BMP4, you see a significant resorption as compared to, to the wild type and also a difference uh, in a size. So now, you know, uh, almost uh, uh, 
12 years later, after the BMPs have been used with the idea that they normally just promote osteoblasts, uh, it turned out to be fully opposite. Why is that so? Because all the experiments in vitro were done on isolated cells. If you have an isolated mesenchymal stem cell or an osteoblast and so on, they will obviously promote the phenotype and you will have like a bone forming effect. However, these cells in vivo are coupled to osteoclasts. So when you increase the bone formation, you always increase the bone uh, resorption. Now, when you give osteoblasts and osteoclasts in the vicinity, you put the BMP, the BMP will promote the function of both cells, and it will promote osteoclasts more than osteoblasts, and you will have a bone loss. So removing BMPs makes uh, more bone. Now, if you do and parallel experiment, and you do the BMP overexpression in mesenchymal stem cells, which in the bone are just in the vicinity of osteoblast-like cells, and they will become osteoblasts, but still are multi, uh, multi-potential and so on. If you do that, then you have what you would really like to achieve. You have a significant increase in bone mass and a bone gain. So just shortly, bone volume and BMP signaling in vivo directly correlate with the cell type in the microenvironment. And there is no guaranteed rule. And the question is, are these results contrary to the rationale behind the clinical applications of BMPs in orthopedics? Do we really put the BMP in between the bone ends to increase the bone resorption and osteolysis? And, you know, the short answer says that during the bone repair, there is obviously a niche of cells directly responding to exogenous BMPs, not endogenous, and the outcome depends on biological and clinical variations in individual patient. That means if you work on an open surgery, you have just, uh, for instance, uh, distal tibia, where are no muscles around, you remove the periosteum and everything, you know, you have a trauma surgery, and now you put BMP, you don't have muscles, you don't have periosteum, you don't have uh, fibrous tissues around, you have just endosteal parts, outcome horrible. You know, so if you do not have a wrapped bone into tissues which, will, which are not coupled, which are muscle cells and periosteal cells, they are not coupled, they will make a exuberant bone. But in between the bone ends where you have also osteoclasts, be very careful. And I'll show you a couple of examples from our device. So which were problems to solve? And that is what we said European uh, uh, union, please give us money, we will make a much better device, which we will. And these are the problems we realize, that body contains around two milligrams of all BMPs together, the whole body. Now, only one gram of collagen can bind 75 micrograms of recombinant BMP2 and 7 if it really binds physically to collagen type 1. However, the composition of these devices contain minimum two and even maximum 30 milligrams of that amount of BMPs. Can you imagine the formulation where you put 15 times above the body composition of your total BMP amount of all the members? So this looks like a horror, but people believed that it's very important to do that. Why? I'll tell you why. Because they have done 26,000 animals were killed for BMP2 and 7 preclinical and clinical and uh, preclinical and tox studies. 20,000, even 25 and more thousand. We made an estimate and only about 1.8 thousand, so that means at least 20 or whatever times less were used for documentation to regulatory agencies. So obviously it was a redundant, redundant uh, repetition of unneeded uh, uh, results and nothing of these results came out. That a small amount of BMP is enough in animal. However, a larger amount is needed in non-human primates. So that means in human, we cannot estimate the, uh, the dose from preclinical studies. So we have to do something big so not to fail. And that big not to fail came to massive resorption, you know, at the end, but people didn't predict this. Okay, bovine collagen is a problem because of diseases, of transmission of uh, viruses, prions, and so on. And enhanced resorption is a huge, huge problem. And we say we are capable of solving this, and I'll show you how. 
because at that time you already analyzed osteogenic molecules in human plasma uh, by um, in systemic circulation to see what is present in systemic circulation and can this lead us to, to the development of something which is novel because we were mistaken by the concept. We had a hypothesis which was wrong. And that is, I deeply believe that having an insight into individual organs, that every organ will be, when injured, producing BMPs to regenerate itself, and that there are uh, organ-specific BMPs, and that these BMPs will just be helpful for the specific organ. And that was a mistake. We believe that BMP9 released from the liver would be important for regeneration of liver and will be released in circulation. And so we, we were sure that beyond TJ beta 1, which is circulating and everybody knows that, we will find BMPs which will be specific for patients and we analyze by proteomics, uh, plasma of patients from different indications and diseases reflecting these organs. And what came out? Nothing. We found only BMP6, uh, very significantly by mass score, by the amount of peptides, and then decided to see what are the structure function characteristics of BMP6, just to, uh, because it's a paralog of BMP7. And 6 and 7 are very, very close. And then we said it can't be. Why is BMP6 circulating and 7 we cannot find? By very, very uh, specific or orbit web analysis, which was done at the first time by uh, Boris Maciek and Matthias Mann in, uh, in Munich. And you know Matthias Mann is uh, the proteomic lead in Europe. And uh, we are sure that what we obtained was absolutely uh, worth uh, believing. And then we did a lot of experiments. I go show you only a couple of slides, uh, which I would pass if you were not just the scientific audience. I would never show that to any of uh, clinicians or whatever, because uh, it's a loss of time. However, I will not go into details. I just want to uh, mention here that BMP6, as compared to BMP7, uh, in mesenchyma stem cells, as comparable to addition of noggin, is significantly less susceptible to noggin. And noggin is a most robust and abundant BMP antagonist found in the body. And then scientists at that time when we were formulating uh, the BMP2 and 7 for clinical use said that a lot of noggin will inhibit BMP2 and 7, so we need a lot of noggin. We need a lot of BMP in the device to just bypass this inhibition with noggin. So if you add now noggin to mesenchyma stem cells and check genes specific for mesenchyma stem cells in BMP7 in combination with noggin and BMP6 in combination with noggin, you see that inhibition of noggin towards BMP7 is much more significant than when you look this inhibition in combination with BMP6. So from that time, we decided that BMP6 is less susceptible you know, to inhibition with noggin. Now, then people said, ah, oh, yeah, it's because of different af affinity. You know, then we checked for the affinity in plasma resonance experiments, and we compared BMP2 for 6 and 7. And you see that 6 underlined here is not different. It's within the same range or even, uh, you know, a little bit uh, less than BMP4 and so on. So we eliminated that that's uh, because of low affinity binding to noggin. It is indeed a high affinity binding to noggin. And then the crucial experiment was showing that when you make a complex between noggin and BMP6 and then add it to the receptor, then it will signal. So BMP6 will separate from noggin and bind to the receptor. However, if you make a complex with BMP7 and noggin and add it to, to the receptor, no signaling. So there he says, look, these are paralogs. They are absolutely identical. Let's see where is that simple amino acid which is responsible for that uh, different binding to noggin. And then we found that it position 60, you know, BMP2 and uh, 4, they have prolines. And then BMP5 and BMP7, they have aspartic acid. And BMP6 has a K for lysine. And then by uh, making different constructs, replacing in BMP2 and 4 this proline by 
uh, lysine and in BMP7 as well, we show that you can increase the activity of BMP7 significantly and uh, make uh, resistance to Nogin uh, significantly better. And this also applies for BMP2, where you replace the proline by lysine. And then we said, okay, lysine is the key amino acid, and we can generate BMPs with superior agonistic uh, activities. And that was, uh, you know, showing that BMP6 is eventually a very good candidate for a new bone device for bone regeneration to lower the dose. Because if, if it doesn't need so much noggin, and then we can eventually lower the dose. Now we made additional series of experiments to compare BMP7 as a full commercial device with different amounts of BMP6 to show whether this in vivo works or not. Before that, we had to change collagen as a carrier because patients do not like bovine collagen to put inside their body. It has been removed from cosmetics. It has been removed from uh, pharmaceutical industry. And then the question remained, why should we keep it then for bone devices? And then we didn't know how to replace it because the carriers are normally inert and there are no good candidates. An inert carrier also perturbs bone for formation, similarly like, uh, like bovine collagen, which people claim it helps cells to crawl, to do whatever, but there is absolutely no proof for that. So just by chance, uh, we discovered in an experiment doing the PK and other uh, experiments for BMP7 in a red uh, serum plasma. We discovered if you use a serum and you use a plasma, you see if you use a serum, then suddenly you see there is after a certain period of time, there is no BMP left uh, in, in the serum. However, if you do the plasma, then in the plasma, BMP stays uh, for a longer period of time. Plasma, 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 plasma. You see serum, 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 serum. And then we said, oh, wait a minute. So the BMPs bind to blood components. What are they binding to? So we did a series, series of experiments to show where the BMP binds to blood components. And then we found that the blood modified is an excellent autologous carrier for BMP to replace bovine collagen. And today we call it whole blood containing device. I will not go into details, but I'll tell you only that um, the question was, can autologous carrier for BMPs replace bovine collagen in a BMP bone device? And we did a lot of experiments. And after a three years fight, we got a patent. To get a patent to use a blood as a carrier was pronounced impossible. Why? Because it's obvious. Whatever is obvious is not patentable. And then we fought uh, directly with the office, and finally we got the, uh, the, uh, the war directly by talking face to face to the patent examiner. And then she said, OK, you are right. Because people throw blood and everything around, but they never focused the use to the blood coagulum as a carrier for a growth factor. And we got a patent for all BMPs and all osteogenic molecules to be added to the blood coagulum of the patient who comes to the surgery ward as an autologous carrier. So that's a significant, significant step forward because there is no bovine collagen. And now we have just to prove whether BMP6 added to this uh, carrier can be a novel device. And that means we have to bypass the side effects done by BMP2 and 7, and we decrease the dose significantly. I show you only a couple of examples. If you compare how the ball heals in a rabbit, and this is the critical size ALNA, and you remove ALNA, ALNA will not heal, and if you add uh, a commercial device, commercial device has one uh, gram of bovine collagen and 3.5 milligrams of recombinant human BMP7, which is huge. Remember, the body has two milligrams of all BMPs. Now you add 3.5 milligrams of one BMP. So what did people expect? You know, that's very strange in clinical trials. Obviously, the commercial device works after eight weeks, and the bone starts to form, you know, in a critical size. So it is induced. Look now what happens if you add to our autologous blood carrier 50 micrograms of BMP6 only, which is 70 times lower amount than BMP7. 
after two weeks, you see something in between the bone ends. But after eight weeks, it is fully healed. Uh, when do you call the bone healed? The bone you call healed when the, uh, when the cortical bone is uh, uh, remodeled and rebridged, and it's here and it's here. It is even remodeled on one side. You still see the, uh, the boundary on the other side, but you, I will give it two more weeks, and it will be absolutely fully healed. So we have a 70 times less amount, and we have like three times accelerated bone repair in preclinical studies. So not to bother you with all the experiments uh, we have done, uh, we just call this uh, new device OsteoGrow, and it will require small amounts of BMP6 in a biocompatible but blood coagulum carrier without bone resorption and inflammation. I'm not showing these results, but we didn't show uh, resorption, pronounced uh, resorption, as you have with BMP2 and 7, and Ivo Dumic, who is here with me, he is working on the comparison experiment between uh, different BMP molecules, and uh, that has been uh, confirmed in other assays as well. Now, this is BMPs and bone repair in a very short way, but that's very narrow indication. Why is it narrow? Because, you know, the expectations based on the versatile biological function of BMPs, and you have thousands and tens of thousands of papers of BMPs and different members in all biology everywhere you can. And they have really s significant biological functions. So, you know, uh, we introduced uh, some of uh, areas, and I'll show you which, in non-orthopedic -or uh, tissues. You know, and the effects of, for instance, BMP6 or some other BMPs may be, uh, you know, translated into regenerative medicine only if you handle the formulation related to systemic administration, solubility, and tissue targeting. I'll tell you why uh, formulation. Formulation, because when you produce BMPs, and the cells produce BMPs like monomers, dimers, heteromers, different concentrations, even when you purify, it is very difficult to purify a dimer for, from others. For systemic use, it must be absolutely perfect, no isoforms, nothing. If you have anything which is outside the standard, FDA will never allow you to go systemic into the blood directly. It is different if you go locally, because you do not expect that locally more than 1.5% of the BMP will release and get into a blood circulation. We have done these studies. Why not? Because it is tightly bound to components of the blood. I didn't go into details, but only about 1.5 to 2%. Whatever by, by regulatory agencies is from local to systemic less than 5% is pronounced insignificant. So we are in the range of 1.5 to 2. So, you know, to get uh, a therapeutic into systemic use, it must be absolutely Perfect. That simply means no isoforms. You cannot have a shortened protein, which normally cells do. It must be always perfectly glycosylated and everything else. Uh, not to bother you with that. For systemic solubility of BMPs is a problem because they are very soluble with the prodomain, but the prodomain is also released when you do them in Cho cells, but not much. It's little. However, the prodomain is crucial for function of BMPs. Now, what we believe that the prodomain is also circulating, we found some of the prodomains, and then they reconstitute, and the cells make a mature form, and the prodomain, and then they merge into circulation and make a soluble BMP. But the prodomain is the component which binds the BMP to the extracellular matrix, and different prodomains have different affinities to different extracellular matrices. Elegantly shown by Elizabeth Robertson a couple of years ago. She is now back from Harvard to Oxford uh, University. When I say versatile functions of BMP, look, for instance, where is RNA for BMP7? Who is producing? It is uh, choroid plexus in the brain. It is also some other brain areas. It is all bone and cartilage in the head. 
it is the heart, you know, it is the intestine, it is the gut, wherever you want are very important uh, uh, transcripts of BMP7 in the development, and they obviously change, and all other members con contribute to almost all organs. So where to start to explore their function, which is not all, only on the de de developmental biology level, but also with an aim to make some applications, because remember there are no applications in Horizon which are not related related to clinics. You cannot apply to anything what is not related to clinics. So basic science in 2014 is bye-bye. Now you have only ERC projects for basic science, which are also not open. So I think uh, the territory is significantly limited for just the basic science if you want a huge ERC project. I mean, F, like old FP7, now Horizon project, all the calls are or for direct clinical use, or for something which is uh, very, very close to clinics. So, you know, we oriented our research and the potential application of the basic science, which we have done ye years ago. To achieve this, you know, we have uh, tested the function of BMPs beyond the skeleton, in the kidney, in the heart, heart very little uh, recently, following uh, one discovery we have patented, then in the development of the tooth, in the pancreas, in digestive tube, and in the liver. I will only touch base in pancreas very little, very little of kidney, and only a few heart slides just to show you the spectrum we are active at this time, and not with an aim to go now into details. Otherwise, I can't cover it, but I think it's important to show you what we are doing uh, just in, in terms of potential uh, collaboration, especially in the area of uh, heart uh, regeneration, which is uh, obviously not, uh, not our specialty. You know, the projects we wrote and applied are within this uh, frame, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, this is the Ostergro. Here we have 11 partners. Uh, Diabetes Cure is also a full pro project. Uh, Cardio pro Protect is uh, in initial stage. Reno Protect we licensed to Pfizer in 2008. I'll just touch base of it. And ERC, we have discovered uh, new BMP1 isoforms at as therapeutic targets and biomarkers for human diseases. I will not have time for this. I will not have time for this. I will just touch base of Reno, uh, Cardio, and show you only uh, recent discoveries in the work we had with the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School in the area of BMP6 regulating iron metabolism. You wouldn't believe, but when you say pleiotropic function, that really means that it's pleiotropic. It doesn't make only bone, it makes a lot more. <laughs> A couple of words about the kidney. You know, kidney started, the whole story of kidney started in 991. And then from 91 on, you have like 1,000 papers uh, in the area of BMPs in uh, renal biomedicine. And uh, that passed uh, the information we published in 1996 that BMP7 uh, significantly improves the kidney function in nephrectomized animals or the animals which have a chronic kidney disease, and then it pick up uh, significantly in, in the coming years. And, you know, most important is what uh, Johnson & John Johnson has done is uh, eventually use of BMP7 as uh, uh, for systemic use in animals which are treated with BMP7 and control animals, and you follow them for 30 weeks, and you see that a huge difference at the end is in survival. The survival rate is here about 60%, and here is about 20% or so three uh, towards one in chronically sick uh, animals. And they are still blocked in clinical trials because to produce, as I told you, a clear, clear, clear growth factor, which has no isoforms, is a very, very difficult uh, uh, item. One of the discoveries from the proteomic analysis of serum I want to show you just is a pro, uh, BMP1. BMP1 is an enzyme. It is not a BMP. It was labeled like a BMP wrongly in 1988, and that didn't change. It's a PCP uh, protease, so it uh, processes extracellular matrix, and it looks like this. It has different domains, and this one circulates. Uh, this is the long uh, arm of BMP1, and this is uh, called in C. elegance NAS39, and this is an extremely old protein which circulates in people and we believe is directly involved in fibrosis. And I'll show you how. In the development of human, it is uh, 
uh, expressed in the kidney, and we did uh, produce a lot of uh, uh, BMP13. We made uh, monoclonal antibodies, which are now in the process of humanization together with uh, Pfizer. And we showed if you give these animals the protein, you have a significant loss of function. However, with an antibody, you can extend uh, the lifetime of these animals. This is one of the applications to Horizon, uh, which we are uh, preparing at this time. I would stop here. I'm sorry I took, it took me 45 minutes. Uh, you know, I cannot acknowledge people because there are too many people. We do work, uh, except University of Zagreb, with uh, MGH at Harvard, with uh, NIH at, in Bethesda, Department of Clinical Science in London, Pfizer Incorporation, Stryker Biotech, Jensen Corporation, Institute Ruger Boschkovic, and more, you know, but to mainly uh, what I showed you is all which is uh, primarily done in, uh, in our laboratory, but we have to collaborate with people because there is no way uh, we can handle from the point of knowledge, technology, and everything uh, different areas. You know, me as an MD, it's very di difficult because now to pass through regulatory hurdles of uh, osteogro, which we develop, uh, can you imagine what is that horror? You know, I have to be a specialist for GMP production of proteins and control talk studies and everything. It's absolutely horrible. But then on the other side, I'm very happy when I receive an ERC project. Not happy. I'm not happy when I receive an outstanding scientific project and people want to move now to clinics and say we will do our preclinical studies in rats then you immediately know that they have no idea of what is efficacy and to toxicology and safety, what is required by regulatory agencies. And such projects, you know, fail. Because, you know, moving from basic science to application is a fully different uh, expertise of people. And it's very difficult to have in one place everything. So you have to call experts from outside or have a contact with pharmaceutical industry, but then they take everything of you and at the end you have nothing, you know. So it's very difficult, you know, if you have an ERC or whatever grant and then you come to commercialization and you have to make a partnership, then that partnership is against you. You at the end, you lose everything, you know. So it's very difficult. If you don't want to do that, you have to be, have developed some different skills. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>